Good morning, guys. How many of you have ever built a house, done a remodel, done an addition? Maybe you added on a garage, you built a large shed or anything like that. How many of you have ever done a project like that? Let me see your hands. Okay, pretty much mostly everyone in here. So then you'll recognize what I have in my hand today. I have a set of blueprints in my hand. Now, why are blueprints so uh, important when it comes to building, remodeling, adding, and doing anything like that when you are constructing a building? Well, the blueprints give us the architectural designs and the information necessary to build exactly what it is that we want to have built. What you do with a set of blueprints, and the reason why blueprints get worn out like this is because whenever there's a question, you go back to the blueprints. You see uh, what exactly needs to be done. The electrician looks at it. The plumber looks at it. The carpenter looks at it. The inspector looks at it. We go through the whole process because in the blueprints are the architectural designs to make just exactly what it is that we want. When it comes to the Word of God, the Word of God is our blueprint for life. It is exactly what God wants for each and every one of his sons and daughters. For each and every one of us, he wants the very best. So how do we know how to get the very best? Well, we go back to the blueprint. We go back to the design that was given to us by the designer. Now, we're talking in this series, in this part of our basic training series about can I trust my Bible? The word trust literally means to put confidence in, to depend on, to rest assured. Can I have confidence in, can I depend on, can I rest assured that this book that I hold in my hand is indeed the very words of God? Can I trust? The word trust is a very important thing in the Christian faith. I heard a story not too long ago about four local church pastors all in the same community who got together and said, let's take a little trip. We just need a little bit of R&R. &R. And so they went to a mountain lodge, and there they spent three days fishing and fellowshipping together and praying together and eating and talking and just enjoying life. And on the second night, it's three days, two nights, on the second night, sitting around a campfire, they uh, began to just really feel a sense of unwinding and comfortable with one another. And one of the pastors spoke up and he said, guys, we're all pastors. We carry a, a lot of confidences. We carry a lot of weight. Oftentimes, we are weighed down under the burden that we bear for the people that we lead. Not to mention the own, our own struggles that we wrestle with each and every day. Why don't we... Why don't we, in the privacy and the stillness and the quietness of this moment, just get gut-level honest with each other? I mean, let's share those things that we're struggling with the most. Let's talk about our own sin. And the guys kind of nodded in agreement, and the guy said, well, I'll go first. So the first pastor says, you know, this is, uh, this is hard for me to say. But the truth of the matter is, is under the weight of the burden that I carry, when I feel like I need a break, quite often I'll run down to the racetrack and, and I'll bet on the horses. And my secret sin is gambling. The other guys are just kind of nodding their head. They can understand that. They can see, you know, hey, that, that's real. That's raw. That's, 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 that's life. And the second pastor begins to speak up and he says, well, guys, to be honest with you, I, I hate to say this, and I don't know of anybody else in the world that knows about this, but I have an anger problem. And every so often, I, I yell at my wife. And you could, you could feel the, 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 the space around that campfire as, as the hearts were burdened and deepened because they understand anger. Anger, we all deal with it, but sometimes we don't deal with it correctly. The third pastor speaks up and he says, guys, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I've never told a living soul anywhere in the whole world, but I have a bottle of rum in my cellar. And whenever I'm having a super tough day, the weight of the world's on my shoulders and I feel like I can't make it. I've just come out of a meeting with the demons, I mean the deacons, and it's been rough. 
I go down to my cellar and I take a shot of rum. All the guys just kind of nod and, uh, you know, I can, I can see that. I can understand that. Well, there's a long pause before the fourth pastor spoke up. The fourth pastor says, guys, I don't know how to tell you this, but my secret sin is gossip and I can't wait to get back and tell all of your congregation about everything you just said. Well, that wasn't a trustworthy moment, right? But we're asking this question, can I trust my Bible? Listen to what D.L. Moody once said, that great evangelist. He said, what we need today is men and women who believe the Bible from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet. Men and women who believe the whole of it, the things that they do understand and the things that they don't understand. What we spent time talking about two weeks ago were two very vitally important words when it comes to trusting our Bible. Those two words were inspired and inerrant. The word inspired simply means, a, a simple, easy definition is this. God wrote the words that he wanted on the pages of the Bible through the holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, and hopefully you're already there. And what does the scripture say? It says, all scripture. And what does the word all mean? Whenever you see the word all, there's no reason to doubt that it means all. It means exactly that. All scripture, including the genealogies, yes, absolutely everything from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training <clears throat> in righteousness. That phrase is breathed out by God. Ex nihilo, that's where we get this idea, this biblical truth, this doctrine of inspiration. It is literally God's breath on a page. And then you'll remember we went over to 2 Peter chapter, two, uh, chapter 1 and verse 21, and we read these words. Peter says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God breathed, carried along by the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the scriptures. But then we talked about the inerrancy of scripture. And that's vitally important because the words are directly from God. They are without error in everything that they say about everything. If he is a perfect God, why in the world would he ever write an imperfect blueprint or letter for you and for me? This is God's owner's manual for life. This is God's blueprint for life. We find it within the pages of the word of God. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, so what's the big deal? Why are you spending so much time talking about inerrancy and talking about inspiration? Why are we spending two whole weeks on this question, can I trust my Bible? What's the big deal? What's the so what? Well, if the Bible is inspired and if the Bible is inerrant, there's a third truth you and I need to understand, and that is this is that it is also authoritative in everything that it addresses. It's authoritative. And you got to understand that principle. You got to understand that precept. You got to understand that truth. The Bible, the Word of God, is authoritative in everything that it speaks about. Now, the Bible is not primarily a history book. But because it is inspired, it is inerrant, and it is authoritative, we understand that everything that the Bible has to say about history is correct. The Bible is not primarily a book about astronomy, but everything that it says about astronomy is correct. The Bible in every area that it speaks to is absolutely correct. Now, <clears throat> what does that mean for you and I? Well, that means, first of all, that the Bible has total authority. The Bible has <clears throat> total authority. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus has just been baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, in the River Jordan. As he comes up out of the water, 
the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to fast and to pray for 40 days, followed by a one-on-one confrontation with the devil. In chapter 4 and verse 4, we see Jesus' response to Satan who looked at him and said, you've got to be hungry. I mean, it has been 40 days without food. It has been 40 days without drink. And so Satan comes to him at this point in time, and he says to him, if you are the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And he tries to appeal to a fleshly need. But notice how Jesus responded, Matthew 4 and verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Think about that. By every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's what the Bible is. It is God's breath on a page. It's his truth. It's his word. And it is authoritative in a total sense. But not only that, let's break that down a little bit more. God's word is also authoritative over all of human society. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Romans 13 and verse 1 says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Back in the book of Genesis, God began to establish three institutions. First of all, he established the family. Second of all, he established government. And then way over in the book of Acts chapter 2, he established the third institution, that is the church. Those are the three institutions established by God. And those are the authority structures that he has set in place. And so those are the authorities that we submit to. Now, these authorities, these human authorities, are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but they have been given according to Scripture for our good, and we are to submit to that authority. So Scripture has total authority. Scripture has authority over all of society. But let's break it down even more because Scripture has authority over each and every individual. Each and every individual. Look with me, if you will, at Joshua chapter 1. Somebody's got to answer that call, all right? We're answering the call this morning of can we trust the Bible. Joshua chapter 1. Do you recognize that passage of scripture? Do you know what's happening? Do you know what the backstory of Joshua chapter 1 is? The first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. Moses authored, under the whole inspiration of the Holy Spirit, those books. The next book in your Bible is the book of Joshua. And the book of Joshua begins with this phrase, Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses was God's great emancipator. He he led the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, and he was to lead them into the promised land. But because of a bad decision that he made one day in his anger, God said, listen, I can't let you in. You can look at it, you can see it, but I can't let you in. Please answer that call. (laughs) It is important, obviously. Where was I? We were talking about Joshua, right? Right? Moses Moses is dead. In May of 2009, my dad passed away May 31st, 2009. And that week, I was studying this passage of Scripture. I was going to preach it in our church. Not only did God's timing work out for me to be able to preach that at a church, but I preached that message at my dad's memorial service to encourage my family because the patriarch of our family had stepped across the threshold of eternity into heaven. What were we going to do? And so we looked at these words. They brought great peace to me and to my family in those days, and I pray that they'll give peace to you as well. Joshua 1, verse 7. Listen to these words, guys. Listen with your heart today. Only be strong and very courageous. 
being careful to do according to all that the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to it from the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Notice the instruction. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. God was encouraging Joshua as he takes over the mantle of leadership for millions of people wandering in a desert, standing at the threshold of the promised land. He says, be strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous. He says it multiple times in this passage of Scripture. But then he goes on and he says, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. You speak it regularly. You meditate on it. You think about it. You memorize it. You live by the principles written in it, for then you will find your way successful. God gave him his marching orders. He gave him encouragement, and he gave him eternal truth. Specifically, this text is written to Joshua, but as in all scripture, there's a secondary giving of it, and that is to you and to me. And that is that we would allow the word of God to be fervent in our mouth, that it would be always on our mind, and that we would let it direct our path. Because when we do that, there is a bonus and a blessing that comes from doing it. In other words, the next thing we see in verse 8 is this. Is this Bible that I hold in my hand today, that you hold in your hand? This Bible is God's secret sauce, if you will, for successful living on planet Earth. It's God's secret sauce. Look at what he says here in verse 8. At the very end, he says this. For then, when you do what I have just instructed you to do, for then you will have good success. That does not mean that you will never suffer loss. That does not mean that you will never have a broken heart. That does not mean that you will never struggle. That does not mean that everything is going to be a bed of roses for the entirety of your life. But what that does mean is this, is that you will be able to go back to the blueprints again and again and again and have God's wisdom and God's encouragement and God's instruction and God's hope. And you can go to it every single moment of every single day to guide every single step that you take whether it is in your business, as a husband, as a father, no matter what role it is that you play in whatever position you are, this is God's blueprint for success on planet Earth. Listen to what the psalmist David said in Psalm 119. And just before we go to the tables, listen to what he said. See if you can put yourself in this passage Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. David loved the word of God. You can hear it in the words that he penned here. I love your word. It's my constant companion. He goes on in verse 105 of Psalm 119, and he writes these words, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And David said, listen, if you want a halogen-powered super light, for the very next step you are to take in life, here it is. This is it. That's why we are so impassioned about understanding the inspiration, inerrancy, and authority of this word. 
It doesn't matter what popular opinion says. It doesn't matter what Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what you feel like doing. When you follow the instruction manual that God has given to you, you will have absolutely everything you need to be a God-honoring success in this life because it's his blueprint for everything, for business, for relationships, for family. You name it, it's here. Take advantage of it. Let's break to the tables, study God's word a little bit deeper, and we'll come back and close it up in just a few moments. came in here this morning and you did not have a high view of the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture, I am not so naive as to think that my arguments are going to cause you to walk out of here believing in the inspiration and inerrancy and authority of scripture. But our goal here is to spur men on to walk with God. And so if this discussion causes you to study for yourself, then we've accomplished our mission. Because if I could talk you into the argument, then I could talk you out of it as well. But I want you, I encourage you, we beg of you, do the study for yourself. Become fully convinced and don't shortchange what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you as a result of your study. It'll make the foundation of your faith far more firm than if you just listen to somebody else's opinion, somebody else's teaching. Study for yourself and be fully convinced and be fully equipped. There's one other thing that the Bible is absolutely crystal clear on that we can trust it without hesitation, reservation about, that it is absolutely positively reliable about. And that is, is that it is the most and only reliable source of what's on the other side of the grave. See, the Bible tells us, number one, that people live on on the other side of the grave. My mom... I expect to get a phone call any minute, is on the threshold of stepping across into eternity as I speak. I'm amazed that she has made it these many days. She's 86 and a half years old. She loves Jesus and is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when I look at her earthly container as it's dwindling away, I simply say, Mom, it's okay. Go on to glory. And people want to know, well, well, how can you have joy in the midst of losing your mom? I, I'm losing a mom, but heaven is her home. Listen, guys. You are not a body that happens to have a soul. You are a soul that happens to have a body. And the shell will one day come off and you will be planted in the streets of glory for all of eternity with no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more pain. There will be dancing and singing and joy as you sit at the feet of Jesus, the one who loves you so much. He said, I love you this much. And he spread out his arms on Calvary's cross and he paid the debt for your sin so that you could have eternity in his presence and abundant life here and now. The Bible says we live on 
on the other side of the grave. Secondly, and I could give you scriptures, but we just don't have the time. Secondly, there are only two places to land on the other side of the grave. One of them is heaven. One of them is hell. One is a place of joy and fulfillment and glory. The other one is a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth and separated from God for eternity. And that's the third thing the Bible tells us, that wherever you land on the other side of the grave, you are there for eternity. The fourth thing the Bible says, tells us is this, that the only way to land on the other side of the grave in heaven is to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You come to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I am a sinner. And my sin has separated me from you. And all of my good efforts, as futile as they are, fall far short. For it is by grace through faith that you are saved, not of works so that no one can boast. For God so loved the world, that's me and that's you, that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. Jesus said, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You say, Hutch, how can you say that? I can say that because it's in the blueprint. I can say that because it's in the book. I can say that because it is the inspired, inerrant, and authoritative word of God. And besides that, there's a lot of only one way to do things in this world. There's only one way to kill certain bacteria. There's only one way to land a jet airplane on an aircraft carrier. There's only one way for you to dial a set of numbers to get a hold of me. So why do we find it hard to believe that there's only one way to heaven? And that one way is Jesus. We're getting ready to come up to Easter season. And on Good Friday, I'll have the privilege of teaching in this place. And I'm so excited about it, I'm already fired up about it. <laughs> so you better be here. God's going to strike. No, I'm just kidding. You know what would be all right with me, guys? would be all right with me is if we went on to heaven before Easter came this year. That'd be all right with me. So I'd be able to see my mom again. I'd be able to see my dad again. I'd be able to see my brother again and my grandparents More importantly, I'd be able to see Jesus who loved me so much that he died on a cross shedding his innocent blood to bridge the gap between my sinfulness and God's holiness. And therein stands the cross of Christ. Can I pray for you? If you're here this morning, March 3rd, 2017, and you have never invited Jesus Christ to be your real and personal Savior, would you do that today? Would you simply cry out to him and say, God, I am so very sorry for my sin." As best I know how, I confess to you that I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. And you made forgiveness available on Calvary's cross. And so as best I know how, Jesus, I invite you to come into my life to forgive me of my sin and to make me brand new within. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering the prayer of my heart today. Father, thank you for your grace that gives to us that which we do not deserve. Thank you for your mercy that keeps from us that which we do deserve. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross, having lived a perfect and a sinless life, died a substitutionary and atoning death so that I might have eternal life. 
and an abundant life here and now as I follow your blueprint for living. For that gentleman this morning that prayed a simple prayer, confessing their sin, repenting, and inviting you to come in, I pray that you would seal that decision in their heart and in their mind and begin today to help them grow, to mature, and to develop, to be all that you would have for them to be and all that you made them to be. And we will be sure to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's close in prayer.